In this video, we'll be looking at how we can go from the reduced echelon form that we calculated last time to actually give us um, a form for all vectors that solve our system of linear equations. So last time we looked at a, a rather messy matrix, and given the system of linear equations that this matrix corresponds to, we were looking to figure out what types of solutions x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6, what vectors of solutions would satisfy the system of linear equations that correspond to this matrix. Um, our first step in trying to solve for these solutions is we reduce our matrix to something called the echelon form, and then from there further to the reduced echelon form, where our um, all of our uh, like columns that have a leading term in them, that leading term is 1. All of the other entries in those columns, both above and below our leading ones, are 0. And every leading one in a row before um, a given row has to be to the left of that leading one. So this um, row echelon, this reduced echelon form, actually gives us a lot of information about the shape of solutions to these linear systems. Um, so looking back at this, our original system here, um, this actually corresponds to another system of linear equations. It isn't the same one that we started out with in the beginning of the problem, but it's still an equivalent system of linear, uh, linear equations, giving us relationships between the variables x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6. Remember that these pivot positions are exactly the entries where our leading uh, term um, lies by itself in a column, and we've rescaled all of our rows in the reduced echelon form to have a 1. Um, these columns correspond in this example to the variable x1, x2, x3, and x5. So those are all of our pivot positions and pivot, um, uh, pivot columns. So something that's worth noting is these, um, these four places where we have a pivot position are going to be in some sense the most constrained of all of our variables. In our other two columns corresponding to variables, so x4 and x6 are both non-pivot positions. The relationship between pivot, um, you know, pivot positions and non-pivot positions will actually be illustrated in even what we call these types of variables later. So a variable that corresponds to a pivot column is going to be called a basic variable. Um, a variable corresponding to a non-pivot column is called a free variable. And this notation is going to come out of our free variables, x4 and x6. Turns out once we're able to pick um, some value for these non-pivot slash free um, variables, that constrains our other basic variables by whatever value this x4 and x6 take on. Um, here's the way that constraint um, pops out. If you look, our previous equation, moving all of the terms containing either a constant or x4 or x6 over to the right-hand side of our equation, we see that once we've chosen x4 and x6, our values for x1, x2, x3, and x5 are completely determined. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose our x, um, x4 and x6 to be just some parameters, meaning some random um, real numbers of our choice, or whatever. So these are constants in our field. And for now, let's, let's, we're going to be mostly looking at R. So given any pair of numbers in R, we uniquely determine our other four variable values. So this actually gives us, from our original matrix, which is equivalent to this kind of messy system of linear equations you can see right there, um, that system of linear equations has all of its solution vectors 
of the following form. Um, given once we have picked any s and t, um, both of them, let's say, real numbers inside our field, um, we know exactly the values of our x1, x2, x3, and x5. So something that's worth noting is the number of free variables in our system exactly tells you um, what the dimension of your solution set will look like. So let's actually examine this for a slightly smaller system so we can actually visualize this. So let's say we started with some matrix and its row reduced um, echelon form looks like this. So for this system we have um, 1 and 2 are going to be our pivot columns. So this corresponds to, let's since we're going to be doing this in three variables, let's actually change these to, instead of x1, x2, and x3, let's call these x, y, and z. And z is our free variable as it contains no leading entry. So we can convert this reduced system of linear, uh, or reduced matrix into the system of linear equations x minus 5z is 1 and y plus z is equal to 4. So some quick um, algebra converts those into all solutions to this system. So x minus 5z is 1, y plus z is 4. Um, that gives us that x is equal to 1 plus 5z for whatever value of z we choose. Um, y is equal to 4 minus z. And so if I choose a value for z, that constrains what x and y can be. So we always, you know, we can choose whatever letter we like for this, but our free variables, we typically will call them things like s or t, and we just make some choice. And by tradition, you're not going to use the same variables that you um, had here, x, y, and z, since these free variables, um, we're trying to distinguish the, the original, like, variable that we were working with and our parameter that we're plugging in to pick out a single solution or a family of solutions. So given, again, if I plugged in 1, I have a solution vector of the form 1 plus 5 times 1, so 6, like a sample solution. If I plug in t is equal to 1, I have the solution um, x, y, z is equal to 6, 3, 1. So that's going to be a point that satisfies our system of linear equations that we started with. Um, let's actually visualize this in Maple right now. So I'm going to pop over to Maple and pull up a file. So I've put our system of linear equations in three variables up here in Maple, um, and I've rewritten just as functions in Maple um, our, our value of z in terms of x for our first equation and our value of z in terms of y for our second. So entering those into maple, um, what this should look like is that all points x and y that satisfy, let's say, just this equation, um, so things where z is equal to 1 fifth x minus 1 fifth, that's going to be points that actually lie on the graph you see here. Um, it's not particularly exciting, it's just a, a plane. Um, same goes for our, our g. This is the set of all points that satisfy in x, y, and z, uh, the r3 that satisfy the equation y plus z is equal to 4. So you note that both x, is, you know, this is invariant across x because no matter what x I plug in, um, if it's y, the y and z value worked, it works. So plotting both of these on the same graph, we see that values that satisfy both of these equations should lie at the intersection of these two planes. So solutions to our system of linear equations here are precisely the points at the intersection of the two planes that we considered individually. On the previous slide, we pointed, we, we noted that from our reduced echelon form of the matrix, we can see that once we pick a value t for our z variable, we know that y has to be 4 minus t, and x has to be 1 minus 5t, or 1 plus 5t. So all points on that line are precisely the points um, 
that we would get by parametrizing, just looking at values, I picked t between negative 1.2 and 0.8 so it'll look nice, we can actually see um, lying at the intersection of our two planes all of the points that we parametrized. So we can actually tell immediately from the form that our vector, um, our vectors of solutions took, that it would be, um, it would be one-dimensional, because for any real value of t I plugged in, I would get a different point that is a solution vector. So even without knowing that the intersection of these two planes in particular was a line, we could look at our solution and read that off. So we'd know that for some parameter t that we could vary, we would see some point on our solution. As a second example, consider the following linear system of equations. So we have x plus y minus c is 0, x minus y minus c equals 0, and x plus 1 third y plus c equals 1. So this is now three linear equations and three variables. And so far, we'd actually kind of expect if we randomly chose three equations and three variables that there would be one and only one solution. Um, there are a few other things that can happen that we'll examine over the next couple of weeks. But for now, I've put these equations into Maple, called this F2, G2, and H2. And our solutions are going to be points that lie on all three of these graphs. So plotting them all at once, we can see that any pair of these intersect along a line. So there's another line of intersection and a line of intersection. And all three of our um, equations have one simultaneous point. Well, again, generically we would expect this to hold. Let's look at an example um, that, while our you know, while we have three linear equations and three variables, we actually won't have this nice, like, single unique solution. In our previous example, we saw that we looked at three linear equations in three unknowns, and we saw that there was a unique solution where all three of the planes that those equations corresponded to intersected. Um, this holds fairly, um, fairly generally, and so the idea is generically, um, which what generically means is if you randomly chose coefficients um, of all of your equations, you'd expect when you have n linear equations in n unknowns to have a unique solution that exists. Um, there are going to be lots of cases where your expected size of the solution set doesn't hold, so let's look at this system of three linear equations and go back to Maple and see what happens. All right, um, we've got our new system of linear equations where some of it's not particularly interesting. There's the plane z is equal to zero, which looks like the xy plane. Um, we've got x minus z is equal to zero. Um, actually, this should be x, minus, x plus z is equal to zero for a third linear equation. So entering the three of these and plotting them we see that this is an example of a non-generic system in that those three planes actually intersect along a line rather than at a single point. So our reduced echelon form for this matrix would have made that fairly clear and we would be able to see how we've got free variables in our system, specifically this is actually uh, any choice of y will work for our solution. Um, so that's, that's about it. When we come back next time, we're going to look at matrix operations. So how could we multiply um, a vector and a matrix together, and what would multiplication of matrices really mean? And look at how this ties into re, um, you know, repackaging a lot of the material that we've done so far um, in finding solutions um, to, for, for linear systems into solving equations that involve matrices and vectors. See you guys next time.